But now that we worked with host-based hypervisors, bare metal hypervisors, and manipulated some VMs in our demos, let's talk about some best practices associated with virtual machines. Now there's a really funny thing that happens in, in our heads when we consider an actual computer and an operating system versus a virtual machine. Uh, we don't always have the same administrative approach or maybe, maybe uh, system image in our heads with regard to virtual machines. So we say, you would never say, um, you know, I really like those computers, give me, give me a whole bunch. Uh, because that would be a pain to manage. But for some reason, we like to create uh, virtual machines at the drop of a hat. We want to run an application, oh, let's create a virtual machine. We've got a test, and let's create some virtual machines. You want a virtual machine, sure, you can have one. So, and they're so easy uh, to, to provision and to build that we just create them willy-nilly. And we forget to shut them down. So we've got all these VMs that are running out there in our hypervisor chassis or in our data center, and they might not be doing anything. In fact, they may not have been doing anything for months but people just forgot to recover those resources. So one of the things that we, that we experience is this idea of VM sprawl. We create virtual machines whenever and wherever we want to without any real thought as to whether or not they should be created or how long they should live for. So we have to keep track of that. It's a really important thing to make sure that you have a policy with regard to VM creation and VM management. And then on top of that, sometimes we add hypervisor chassis out there or put hypervisors in virtual machines. Um, and so we want to try to avoid the proliferation of not only VMs, but also hypervisors themselves. So the VM sprawl gets to this whole idea of how many doggone VMs do you need? Now, a really uh, interesting problem crops up when you start building virtual machines. The virtual machines that we've been building for our demos here are actually very lightweight. I started off with a minimum build for CentOS, and then I just installed the tools that I needed. So that means the VM is pretty much, you know, the size and, and uh, well, the size that I need it to be, and takes up minimal resources. But even at that minimal install, it was a gigabyte in size. What if we said, we're gonna not only build a VM that does that, but every single VM that we build is also going to have an office suite in it. So if we use the example of Microsoft Windows, and then we went ahead and installed Microsoft Office on top of that, the VM starts to become very, very bloated. And if you did that with every single VM, then not only do you have a lot of VMs because you're not controlling the proliferation of the VMs, but also the VMs are enormous. Now, if you create a template that is enormous, then every virtual machine that's created based on that template will also be enormous. And half the VMs will have things in them that people will never use. So that's a real problem. Another thing that we forget to do, because they're VMs, oh, we don't need to patch them, they're VMs. Well, it has the same exploit that a regular computer would use or would have. You would never think about connecting your computer without patching it or running some updates or things like that, but for some reason we don't do that with, with VMs as often as we should. And then of course, if you're just sticking software into every VM, the other thing you have to consider is the licensing, right? Licensing can get a company or an organization into real problems if you're not paying attention to it. Okay? So absolutely consider the licensing issue when you're installing software into VMs. Do we really need to virtualize everything? If you have an application that needs to be run, you have to ask the question whether or not it should be virtualized or whether or not physical resources should be applied to it. Um, will that application even be able to run in your virtual environment? The other thing to consider is there, there's a domino effect. So I create a virtual machine, now I need to ask for resources, right? So that virtual machine has to be provisioned. On top of that, the virtual machine now needs to have access to the network. So somebody's got to configure the network connectivity. The virtual machine needs access to things. So this domino effect continues on and on and on because we didn't really think about the impact of virtualizing this particular entity. When we start to build our virtual architectures, it, it must be a consideration uh, to think about 
all of the, the things that might be virtualized. What are your users going to need? What servers are we going to need? Where is the database? Uh, what is the access going to look like? And if you, if you can imagine an organization that says, yes, we're going to fully embrace virtualization, well, the sheer scaling of that problem becomes somewhat monumental. So it's a real concern that we're going to handle all the plumbing that's necessary. How are all the virtual machines going to be backed up? What is our disaster recovery plan? What happens if something uh, strikes our, our data center and the data center goes down? We have a power outage, things of that sort. We can ask ourselves the question, what if everything was virtual? If you were to have a company or an organization that fully embraced the idea of virtualization, that is, they virtualized end user desktops and servers and the database and everything. We just put everything in um, the virtual architecture somewhere. Well, do you have everything that you need to support it? Uh, do you have all the plumbing, all the networking in place? Uh, are you going to get the performance that you need out of it? Do you have the sheer horsepower to do it? Do you have the power? And then once you properly provision everything, now we have to wonder how we're going to do backups. Um, how, what are we going to do in the case of disaster recovery? If something happens to the data center, are we prepared for all those eventualities? Another important consideration with regard to virtual machines is who is allowed to create virtual machines? Can any of your administrators do it? Um, can a specific set of end users do it? Uh, and if they can, um, we want, do we want to limit the number of virtual machines that they can create? Who is allowed to create clones? What is our, do we have a cloning policy? Uh, and so, as we saw, full clones take up just as much space as VM creation. And sometimes, uh, somebody that can't create a VM can actually create a clone. So we want to be a little careful of how we manage our infrastructure. If we talk about an individual virtual machine here, uh, you saw that we, we've been using the Linux distros for our virtual machines, and they don't take very much in the way of, of processing. You know, a single processor, a single NIC, uh, a couple of gigabytes of RAM, virtualized RAM, and um, a small hard drive is what we use to provision those. But if you have a server, you might actually want to allocate much more in the way of virtual RAM. You might want to have a bigger hard drive if you're storing lots and lots of data. So an important question to ask when you're provisioning virtual machines is, what do you need in the way of resources? Some people will overestimate what they need and some people will underestimate. But we want to have the ability also to go in and do some tweaks. The hypervisors give us some tools to take a look at virtual network performance and virtual machine performance so that we can understand the actual resources that are needed. The Amazon Web uh, Services approach is to give everybody the same size virtual machine, but you may not be doing what the, the next person is doing, and so that provisioning may not be appropriate for you. Now, templates can be a very, very good thing. You have a template for a particular VM, that way you don't have to go through all the, the configuration of the VMs, but make sure that your template is sized properly and that a particular VM request is appropriate for that particular template. So tools are an important thing to think about. When you are dealing with a hypervisor, you want your hypervisor to be able to give you the information that you need with respect to the performance of not only the chassis, but the virtual machines and the virtual networking and your storage. So can you see what you want to be able to see? VMware tools are just one example of something that we might add to a virtual machine to give us a little more control and visibility into what's happening with that virtual machine. But certainly the hypervisor itself gives us a bunch of insight into what's happening with the performance of the disks, the connectivity, uh, and the utilization, the CPU utilization or the memory utilization for the individual virtual machines. All right, I, I said this earlier and I will say it again because people forget it all the time. A virtual machine is a virtual instance of an operating system. So just because it's a virtual machine, if I virtualize Windows XP, it's still Windows XP. It's still vulnerable. This machine is Windows 7, and I just got done taking care of all the Microsoft patches, all the vulnerability. And it's not enough just to patch the operating system. Remember that you have applications, like Office, that must be patched as well. And you have to take the same approach to uh, virtual machines that you took to physical machines. When it's time to patch, when it's time to do your virus checks, make sure that you handle them.
All right, so as we saw with some of the demos that we, we've done so far, and as we'll see with some of the demos that we're going to do later on, um, there's a lot of work that goes into building the hypervisor chassis, the virtual machines, maybe doing some software install in the virtual machines, and you don't want to have to redo that in the event of an outage. We've already said that virtual machines can be backed up, but let's, let's step back here for a sec. Remember that when you're dealing with disaster recovery or backup scenarios, what we're trying to do is protect everything that we can. So for example, we have the switch chassis that we're going to be using in our, de in our demos. So I want to have a hardware backup for the switch, for example. I want to back up my configurations. Our approach to hypervisors and our virtual machines is no different. We have the hypervisor chassis itself. What happens if I lose the chassis? What happens if I lose that blade in the data center? Uh, what about what was on that blade or that storage media? There's the virtual machines. So I need to have a recovery scenario for the hypervisor. I need to have a recovery scenario for the virtual machines. The virtual machines should be backed up or my, have the ability to migrate from one hypervisor chassis to another. And then we have to ask ourselves, what was the virtual machine doing? So it's one thing to recover a virtual machine. Oh, the virtual machine crashed. That's OK. We'll start it back up again. But what if the virtual machine was a web server? Now we have to make sure that the web server is protected as well. And then all of the files that the web server touches or the database that might be, it might be interfacing with. So it's not just enough to say, well, we're, we're ready with redundancy on this particular object. We have to think about, you know, again, that domino effect. What is running on what? So we've got a hypervisor chassis, the VM, and then what was the VM doing and what data was the VM accessing? So make sure that you have the resources necessary and the time to do your backups. Now snapshots, some people think of snapshots as a backup strategy. They're not. If, uh, if you use snapshots, remember that snapshot is an instance of in time. But if the base VM is gone, those snapshots are worthless. So an important question to ask us as we're, as we're talking about redundancy, we're talking about our backups, how does your failure uh, happen? How does failover um, recover from the failure? So the kinds of things that we're thinking about are stuff like power. What happens in the event of a power outage? Now, in the event of a power outage, if I'd have, if, during the demos, if I'd have lost power, then I would have had to start from scratch and power everything back up again. But normally, we don't want to do that, right? So we, we have backup power supplies. We have battery backup and things of that sort. Um, but you want to think very carefully about what your strategy is for handling the hypervisor and the VMs and things of that sort. So again, this is not just maybe a redundancy issue, but what is your response going to be when you need that disaster recovery action to actually take place? Now, one of the real benefits of working with a particular vendor is that you know most vendors have been doing this for a while. So it's a very reasonable question uh, to ask when you say, well, what is the recommendation for disaster recovery? You don't have to do this, you know, from scratch, right? So um, there are usually best practices for deploying any of the things that we've been talking about here and uh, best practices for handle, how to handle backup, redundancy, and disaster recovery. Uh, storage is certainly an issue here. As we'll, we'll see later on, there are lots and lots of available methods for handling storage. Our hypervisor chassis has an internal data storage. But do you want to take a network approach to data storage? Do you want to have more direct attached storage? We'll go over some of these architectures later on. And then how are you going to store what you're doing? So for example, uh, if I'm, I pick a storage strategy of some kind. Now the one that we're going to talk about and show later on is a network attached iSCSI target. In that case, I can have virtual machines that are stored on that iSCSI target. But I can also store my install media somewhere. And then there's the data that the virtual machines are accessing. Uh, when a user connects and uses that virtual machine, what is that user using the virtual machine for? It's usually to get something done. So 
we have user-based files, we have the server-based files that are being accessed. And, and this is a question of not just what are we going to do in the case of uh, you know, a needed backup or something like that. This is what is our storage strategy itself? Where are we going to put all this stuff? Uh, it's an actual decision. When, when you say, all right, I'm going to build this VM, one of the questions when you build a VM is where do you want to store it? And so you need to think about this strategy as you're going along. Uh, once you have network-attached storage, certainly you have an exposure there because now the network-attached storage has a network connection that can have an outage. So you do you have a redundancy solution there? Uh, do we have performance um, examination there? So we need to consider all of the parts of the puzzle. Earlier on, we were talking about VM sprawl. It's very easy to create and provision virtual machines. We also want to have a policy that says, how long is this virtual machine allowed to exist? Uh, you can take a look at when the last time virtual machines were being used. And so it's a, it's a very prudent pro policy to periodically go through, take a look at the inventory of virtual machines, see which ones are being used, and make the determination as to whether or not they can be shut off. Because at that point, you can start recovering resources. Remember that when we were talking about some of the market data and some of the... the um, the work that administrators are now doing, the more virtualization you do, the ratio of virtual machine to administrator climbs way high so that you have hundreds of virtual machines per administrator. And we want to do everything that we can to manage those virtual machines and make, uh, you know, make that, that administrator's life a little easier, but also recover all of those resources. Now, an important, uh, certainly an important aspect to all of this is security. Remember that no matter what, we're dealing with software. A hypervisor chassis can be attacked. A virtual machine that's running a server can be attacked. And so it's important to realize that just because something is virtualized doesn't mean that it's bulletproof. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we protect our management traffic. Management traffic should be isolated from production network traffic at all costs. So in my case, I use a separate management network, a separate management VLAN, and in many cases we can create separate virtual connections for those, that management traffic as well. You have to consider, once you're virtualized, where is your data being stored? Are you using a managed services provider of some kind, cloud, uh, cloud solution? So how are you going to get access to your data if there's a problem, but also who else might have access to the data? What is your level of exposure? If you have a leak or a breach of some kind, what is the cost to repair the leak? What is the cost of prevention? And what are the, the key assets for the business? These are all part of the look that we must take into security. When we run a traditional network, we can install uh, monitoring points in the network. So that is to say, that I can do monitor sessions, I can do an intrusion prevention system or an intrusion detection system, network antivirus. I have all of these tools that I can install in the network somewhere so that I can see what's happening. I can put firewalls at all my uh, points of ingress and egress. But when I'm virtualized, and in particular when I have a cloud solution, sometimes it's a little more difficult to see what's going on on the network. And so, do you have a set of monitoring tools or a set of um, devices that you can use to see the traffic that's actually being used? And if you can't see the traffic, are you collecting the statistics that you need to know whether or not somebody's attacking your server, attempting a denial of service, doing failed authentications, all of these kinds of things? And the last, last step in security that we'll talk about here is that um, we had this this question as to who was allowed to create a VM. Who is allowed to instantiate these things, create clones, things of that sort. And what we're trying to do there is uh, trying to limit the VM sprawl, right? But another really valid question is, who's allowed to start or stop this virtual machine, right? Can anybody reach in and touch this virtual machine to shut it down? So, Permissions are not only there about the creation and, and the collection or the, the provisioning of resources, but also the control and management of a particular VM.
Remember that once you have a VM and you configure remote access like SSH, you have to ask the question, who's allowed to SSH to that VM? Because that person now has the ability to shut down a VM on the, on the command line. Once we start doing something like network functions virtualization, we're virtualizing uh, firewall appliances or routers and switches, we need to think also who has access to those devices. In the same way we would if we were building a rack full of gear. All right, well, that's a look-see into some uh, best practices when dealing with virtual machines, virtual architecture, and any other object that might be virtualized. Now it's time to take a look at another architecture virtual desktop infrastructure.